Welcome to the Understanding Boys podcast. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We pay respects to leaders past, present and emerging. The Understanding Boys podcast is a series of conversations exploring what it is to be a good man these days. So if you had a story about being a good man and that you could tell a 14 year old boy and he'd actually listen, what would that story be? And that's really what I'm asking our guests today. I'm Dr. Ray Swan. And we're a community of teachers and parents concerned with the education and growth of boys in the modern world. The series is brought to you by Brighton Grammar, an all-boys school in Melbourne. To learn more about the podcast, please visit understandingboys.com.au. In today's podcast, we speak with musician, singer-songwriter Jim Laurie. For the past decade, Jim has made a name for himself as an emerging independent artist His latest album, Slacker of the Year, has drawn critical acclaim, with the music magazine saying he should be considered one of this decade's finest songwriters. Jim Laurie's songs explore a range of ideas and emotions from love, loss, to the joy and wonder of life. As a multi-instrumentalist, originally a drummer, then guitarist and singer, his music creates sonic images reminiscent of bands like Fleetwood Mac, Jackson Brown and Neil Young. Today's podcast will be a little different to our usual format. We'll explore Jim's artistry, talk about growing up and then get his thoughts on masculinity. We'll listen to some of his music. So let's start with the opening track of his latest album, Feels Like It's Happening in a Dream. So welcome, Jim, to the Understanding Boys podcast. Cheers, Ray. So I guess a good place for us to start would be to um, you know talk about making an album. I mean, most of our listeners probably wouldn't have ever had the opportunity to make an album. How do you make an album of music? Where does it start? So is it an idea that appears in your brain, or are you full of songs already and they need a, they need a home? How does one record an album? Where does it begin? It's a good question, uh, and I think it's it's different for everyone. Um, for me personally, uh, it usually starts with a couple of songs that uh, I've written that are heading down a certain theme that I then want to uh, build on. Uh, for me, songs come from anywhere. Uh, it could be something that I'm, I'm setting out to write specifically or it could be an idea that just happens in the moment. Um, and then once those songs start building into a bigger picture, I guess um, I start to see the end game a little clearer and uh, the focal point uh, becomes uh, yeah, a bit more focused. And then uh, I guess, yeah, you start thinking about the practical side of it um, rather than the creative side of it, which is where are you going to get the cash to fund it? Yeah. Have you done enough you know, pub shows to pay the thousands of dollars it costs to produce it? And yeah. I mean, there's there's plenty of money to go for grants in um, in the arts at the moment, so that's generally a good starting place, and then that will determine whether it's possible and what it's going to sound like and how it's going to come out, and then just organising all of the crew that you want to be involved, um, from band to record label, and then just getting them all riled up and and Excited wanting to be part of it. Ready to jump on board? 100%. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, there's so many different skills in in making 
art, isn't there? Whether it's performance art or visual art, and you know everything from that you've just highlighted. You know, having that concept and and having a skill set around building uh, content or you know instrumentation, and there's that whole area. And then you've got the you know the business side of it about actually funding it and producing it and and running budgets and mm. um, I guess the the stewardship and the um, you know the, the management side that you know you, you have to be a you know a person of integrity that is reliable and you know so you're kind of balancing out um, all of these things whilst also um, you know finding time um, yeah. and casting I guess casting casting out into an area where you just really don't know whether what you're doing sounds any good or is any good or how it's going to be received that must be nerve-wracking in a sense yeah a hundred percent and I mean you use the word balance and that's that's part of it I mean I spent hours and hours alone uh, writing before I bring anything to anyone and then yeah the, the nerves hit when you present that song to your friends who are in your band and then they hit again when you start going to management and going to your label and then once you've made the album you're also uh, taking it to to the press and going hey have a listen to this thing that I've I've just poured my heart and soul into and then you cross your fingers that they get it and you know sometimes they don't um, and sometimes they they really do and yeah the whole process is is quite a strange one in that you are just putting yourself out there hoping that people understand it Mm. but yeah there's a lot of self-doubt involved in that as well considering how much time you spend by yourself and you lose perspective sometimes and I mean I remember one of my albums I I did all these extravagant string section things to it and then listened to it one day like months into um, post-production and just realized that it was wrong and I just spent, didn't, didn't work for the how did you know it was wrong it didn't work for the the type of song or uh, thought it wasn't well, going to be commercial it, or? it was the whole album that they were on and I just um, listened to it and I was like this is this isn't me um, I got carried away in a in a misunderstanding with myself because yeah. because I wasn't existential um, crisis yeah it was a weird weird sort of moment but you, you hope that um, that moment of clarity hits at some stage in that situation um, luckily it did for me in that one um, but yeah th- the amount of time spent alone and then uh, once you bring it to, to people you trust as well that they can go hey this is wrong um, or this is right this is, yeah but it is I mean my strengths I think lie on the creative side I'm, I'm pretty terrible on the business side of right. things so finding people that you trust as well is, is a really important thing and I guess building those relationships. It's interesting how you, when you when you were saying that, I was thinking about how much of making an album is actually quite a an entrepreneurial skill set. You know that fail fail quickly, fail often, testing and retesting, prototyping, building. Yeah. Um, you know, and then having the the real courage of your convictions to actually um, break new ground and see something where perhaps other people can't see it. Because I think that's what a good music does and I think actually um, if you don't mind me saying with, with your latest album that's what it does I think is it it sheds light into areas that um, that perhaps haven't really been uh, explored and and I think that when you do that there's people don't see it for the first time and there's this kind of cruel jibe in a way from the gods which is you've done all this work you've worked really hard then you have to go around and convince people that it's worth you know it's worth something and please listen to it and that I think as a creative type, that must be must be a hard um, you know hard thing to push at the end of such an exhaustive process, perhaps. Yeah, it is, and I mean, in some respects, that's yeah, it is a hard process to um, to go through. In others, I think another another really important skill to have in general is one where you surround yourself by people who are aligned with what you're doing and vice versa because you definitely need that community of people of yes people around you like if if i hadn't found people who who were doing similar things to what i was doing or at least trying to break different areas of ground then that net of people 
encouraging me that I was on the right track creatively uh, wouldn't have been there. And yeah, the process probably would have been a lot more scattered and scary and driven more by anxiety than the surety that it needs. Right. Yeah. So it's almost like you're, there's two parts to that, isn't there? There's that, what am I moving towards and trying to create and what am I moving away from? What am I kind of compelled to do? Because I imagine um, if you're an artist, that you've there's an impulse that wakes you up in the middle of the night and says, hey, here's an idea for a song and you write it down or you must be humming or tapping something that comes to you. It must be a, a strange process, I imagine, you know, where these ideas come from. Yeah, create creativity for me is a really strange one because sometimes a song will come to me, you know, while the internal voice is having a chin wag while I'm walking down the street or something like that. And it's funny, like I've found that putting it in my phone as a note or humming it into the phone just doesn't cut it because it's, it's kind of like you put it in and then it's a text message you've already read. You don't need to go back to it. Sometimes I, I do a big stock take of thoughts and lines that I've come up with that I, you know, at some point in time I thought were profound. And, you know, there, there are absolute duds, absolute gems and a lot that fall in the middle. And, yeah, th- there is a point that you have to give yourself time to nut out stuff, put it down on paper if it's really good and, you know, give it a few hours of a day to see if it was worth what you thought it was worth. But I mean, at the same time, sometimes you'll sit down with the specific intention of writing a song um, or writing a a chorus that you want for a song to really kick it into the next gear. And it will either go to a point where you absolutely love it and you've done a really great job, or if it goes the other way, it's so disheartening that you might not go back to playing yeah, guitar right. for a week or something yeah. like that. Crushing almost. Yeah, and I've definitely gone through times of um, low creativity because I've given myself a specific task that I've failed to meet. Mm. Um, yeah, which I, I, I think it, that also comes down to um, just discipline. Like it comes down to knowing that uh, not achieving something like that doesn't mean you won't achieve it in two hours mm. yeah so much of that is is in a way ca- quite counterculture to the society that we live in you know we don't you know two hours you know that's like that's an eternity you know in terms of the multitasking and all the different emails we could check and text and insta and everything else that we could <laughs> yeah, expose ourselves to i mean it is is art making a bit kind of countercultural at the moment even more so perhaps than in days gone by well, I, I mean, in the creative process, all, all social media is an enemy for me. Like, I, I really struggle with it. And it's becoming more like that with uh, my, um, just myself in general. I'm, I'm finding spending any time on social media is really counterproductive to my life. Um, in terms of counterculture, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just, I just thinking, you know, the idea that, you know, you were saying earlier how sometimes you just need to give yourself a few hours yeah. to do something yeah um and the culture that i experience a lot of the time is that that's pretty hard to find you, you know yeah. we're, we're loaded up with expectations or jobs or tasks we kind of live in this culture that is all about efficiency and um you know making things happen and you know things are kind of yeah. within units and you know there's kind of a, a language around around that um whereas um, what you were just saying about, you know, sort of trial and error and, and time and reflection and it's almost a different a different rhythm. And, yeah, just wondering how that, that – uh, it strikes me that would be something that would be, you know, part of actually being creative in the modern sense is, is, um, is difficult to manage, maybe more difficult than perhaps it was even, you know, 10 or 15 years ago when we didn't have quite as much uh, media and transparency and things weren't quite, I don't think, the same pace. Yeah, I, de- I definitely think that plays into, um, yeah, that that idea of uh, spending maybe half a day on a song and then not being happy with it. That time um, can sometimes feel like time wasted rather than it being a productive mistake. Because mm-hmm. um, mistakes, yeah, you can look at them either way. Um, I, it's always healthier for me to look at um, 
not getting something right creatively as a learning process of where to go next. But yeah, it definitely hurts a bit more to the ego, I guess, and um, and the role that ego plays in creativity when you spend half a day in that um, yeah in that space of using your time productively versus yeah what you could be doing um, with emails and and that side of, of the business side of your artistic pursuits. Mm. Wanted to um, jump in a little bit more, if, if it's okay, into the album itself. Um, one of the things that just really appealed to me early was the song which is called The Slacker of the Year. Copy paste another hectic day. I woke up late. And I'm still so tired All of my responsibilities Turn into casualties Till I get high I could sleep for days Don't leave your flowers where I lay I'm not coming down from here I could be the slacker of the year It's got a great film clip and uh, hopefully we can include a link to that um, somewhere um, in the notes for this um, podcast because that's it's brilliant. I love the irony in the song. I'm just going to read out just some of the lyrics um, for the listeners so they can kind of tune in a little bit to the next part of the conversation. Um, so this is what Jim Jim sings about. I could get you to, maybe I'll make it to you to sing it to <laughs> I could sleep for days, don't leave your flowers where I lay. I'm not coming down from here, I could be the slacker of the year. I had dreams of going out today, find a brand new place to leave my mark on. Into a world of possibility, a sad celebrity, I could go far. I could earn their praise, taking prizes from the mad parade. I can hear the people cheer, calling me the slacker of the year. It's great. <laughs> he must have enjoyed um, putting that together and getting all the rhymes and the and the and the rhythm and meter of that that so well polished. I don't think I did a very good job of reading it. I'm glad that the irony wasn't lost. I mean, it's a song about being unable to do something in the murk of your own laziness yeah. and like counterproductivity. But yeah, I guess the, the idea of the song is like this idea comes out of that space of being a slacker but then that idea over the three verses uh, goes from just an idea to leaving the house and becoming a celebrity and then the third and then ends with the idea that you'd be a superhero called the slacker of the year with the, with the world looking up at you as you fly on by but I think you would have a number of acolytes uh, that would that would follow that superhero cult as well in terms of you know, the cult of the slacker. It would be um, yeah. Where do we sign up? Um, well, I mean, yeah. I, the the nice thing about it is that yeah, I can give myself that um, that title and and be happy with it. I mean, I, I ended up naming this album after that song, which is another um, layer of the irony of it is that mm. the album came out of that space in a way. And, yeah, the, the idleness of, I mean, you know, being non-creative uh, when, you, when you want to be creative um, can be a painful space to be in. And so can you just, just unpack that a little bit more for the, for the listeners? Um, I guess what we were talking about just before about the idea of um, spending time on, on your creativity and then being unhappy with what comes out is equally as um, as detrimental to your own health as uh, not being creative when you have a creative uh, pursuit that you want to act on. Mm. And so I guess this song came out of the idea that I'd, I'd been wanting to write something to finish the album 
and this was the last song that I wrote for the album. And in a lot of ways, it, it kind of moves away from the themes uh, of the rest of the album. But it also pulls everything together because it was, yeah, it was a space that I wasn't quite happy with how much creativity I was indulging in. Yeah. And then finally got there. Uh, I think I wrote it in a day and I was totally stoked at the end of it. I was like, oh, cool. I'm, yeah, it I, could, I could play the role of a superhero. Yeah. But though, I mean, the whole, the whole song, when I first wrote it, I thought, oh, this is a great joke. And then I looked, I mean, it often happens, you look back at your own lyrics and you go, oh, now nah, there's, there's a bit more there. Yeah. And, you know, after a bit of fine tuning, you go, cool, I'm, I'm happy with how this whole thing is. Yeah, I think it's one of the songs, as I said in the introduction, that, you know, I was saying earlier rather, that it does shed light in, in kind of a, a part of our culture that we don't often talk about, which is the, you know, the so much the idea of slackness literally but um you know so am i engaging because again in the film clip which is uh, essentially you sort of being transported around town from memory you know in a car kind of waking up and yeah walking you know, around foot screen walking around in your pajamas <laughs> yeah <laughs> like you didn't get arrested um and um you know that i guess in that you know it's about maybe not connecting as well or sort of this sort of you know sense of sort of floating around and you know where, where is the reality and and the, and because again it's, it's in a suburban as well so mm. it's not like you're floating around the countryside you know going through the whatevers you know yeah. you're, you're in this kind of really busy place just mm. kind of floating around yeah i suppose in, yeah in the song there is the presence of of people's reactions to and i mean that's that's one of the things that you, as you know someone who has creative funks or you know just emotional um downturns and where you're unproductive in your life in general um you're always comparing yourself to the storyline that you've been fed from society that these are the status symbols you acquire throughout your life and um you know this is the period of time that you get married and you have kids and you get that job and you've done your uni and all of that stuff um but if you if you haven't achieved that stuff by the time you're 31, which is when the album came out for me, you know, wh- what do you think of your own life? Like, do you take on board the voices from out of society and go, oh, no, they're right, like maybe I am doing something wrong? Or do you go, no, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is important? And I guess, yeah, the song kind of is a bit of a joke about that because those voices aren't integral. Yeah. In some ways, I think they're integral in for for some people in a lot of ways. But yeah. so it's about knowing yourself in in that and where you sit with your own sort of true north about what's important. I think so. Yeah, knowing knowing uh, where you sit within that narrative. Yeah. I think for, as a songwriter, a lot of people, um, some people are aware of it. Some people aren't. The um the idea that it's because it's a non traditional pursuit in life. Uh, that there is a lot of questioning, a lot of self-reflection, asking yourself whether you are doing the right thing, what the outcome is. The security of a songwriter's life uh, isn't set in stone, mm. not as much as someone who's building a career in business or or law or medicine or something like that. Mm. But you do it because you love it and you take, I guess when you start that, you don't understand that you're uh, you're going into a bit of a gamble with your own ideas and and whether w- whether people will accept that. And I guess when you you know going back, say you know sixteen years or so now, you know you're at the end of your secondary time, and you're sort of casting ahead, and you're going, look, I'm going to give this everything because it needs everything. I know for this to be what I want it to be, I have to take this risk. And throw caution to the wind and just jump in and and you know that's what i'm going to do i guess there's there's um you know when you look back do you think you would have done anything anything differently um i'm not sure uh whether i would have done anything differently there's there's definitely uh revelations that i had along the way that um yeah as a 
as a teenager, I, I didn't quite get the full picture of what it meant to be a musician in Australia or an artist in Australia. I mean, the music community in Australia is relatively small. And so you end up meeting the people that you've been looking up to for years over, over the course of six months and finding out that those people all have day jobs and, you know, drive trucks or also engineer your mate's albums. And it's a bit of a, an awakening then that you go, oh, wait, th- that romanticised idea about being a musician isn't actually true for a lot of people. I mean, there's definitely people that, you know, can buy a house on their career, but for the majority of people in the Australian music uh, scene or the creatives in the Australian music scene, I don't think that's a, a reality. I do wanted to talk a bit about, you know, some of the, the big themes in, in the album, at least as I perceive them, and these could be <laughs> could be off the mark, but I think it's, it's, it's pretty clear that in the album, you know, you, you do explore... Um, loss and disconnection and we sort of touched on disconnection already um, in the song The Ties That Bind um, at the risk of butchering your lyrics I'm going to read that again but for the benefit hopefully of the listeners um, you wrote you know all these streets just lead my mind back to better times and telltale signs I guess we knew this song would come lying deep within time to begin to move on but if I sang your name would you hear mine too ringing true as one and the ties that bind they just need some time to fi- fall away and come undone I nearly got through it without <laughs> <laughs> mixing up one of the words uh, it's, it's really it's, it's like poetry it's, it's beautiful it's, it must be based on you know a real and connected experience of loss for you yeah I, f- when I wrote that particular song I was coming out of a quite a long relationship a really important relationship in my my life where I learned a lot about myself during and also afterwards um, and the process of uh, I guess the six months uh, after that relationship ending is when I wrote this song and it yeah it really centers around that idea that yeah you have to move away from something that you'd conceived as being what your identity was, I guess, in a way, but also like needing to give it space and time to um, really settle and move into the next chapter. Yeah. Part of my questioning, um, Jim, is that, you know, a lot of the current discourse, and thank you for sharing that um, as well, but part of the current discourse in, in the mental health space for young men is a lot around loss and disconnection. And, you know, generally, you know, it's a, it's a stereotype, but I think it's probably a societal determinant still for us that, you know, men generally don't, don't have ease when it comes to talking about things like loss and, and disconnection. And, you know, you were saying earlier about that idea of, you know, um, something creative unexpressed can be really un- as unhealthy as not being able to to find something um so what i wanted to, to to talk a little bit about was just the power of art in in providing a medium for people to engage um with some of these more complex issues and um things that maybe are a bit harder to talk about when i was a kid i remember i went and saw um the film et have you seen et it was steven spielberg it's just um a little puppet um that kind of comes from outer space and lands anyway at the end of the film Spoiler alert! But at the end of the film, uh, ET goes home, which he wants to do the whole film. And I remember I was just crying, you know, watching this film as a kid. And I remember, like, you know, in the cinema, you could see like the light on other people's faces, and I could see there were men crying. Yeah. I think it was probably the first time I'd actually ever seen a man cry. Yeah. And then I kind of realised that oh, it's actually it's not so much about this puppet because I couldn't imagine how you know a grown man would cry about a puppet sort of flying back to the moon sort of thing. Yeah. But I realised, oh, they're crying because it's their own experience of loss. Mm. You know, they're thinking of times where they've been left or they had to let go of something or like the ties that bind, uh, you know, falling away. Hansard is such a bitter friend But I felt the chain Come in on the wind 
Is it a powerful thing? Is it an important thing? I mean, it is self-evident, I suppose, from what I'm saying, but the role of art to kind of stimulate, you know, for, for boys and for young men, I suppose, as well, like coming into kind of working out some of their the emotional stuff yeah. that they experience. Um, at the risk of um, being a little cliché, uh, I do think that art and songwriting for me uh, is mostly a cathartic process um i'm a sucker for a sad song and um i really i really do like connecting with um the darker parts of like an artist uh i've never never i don't can't really think of a, a happy song i was thinking about this before i can't think of a happy song that <laughs> i've actually written. written so it's like it feels yeah. like it happens in a dream's pretty you know, it's got a light feel to it. That's yeah. the opening song. Yeah, that's that's. We'll I mean, go to the lyrics. <laughs> yeah, we'll just leave, we'll the leave it there. Okay, yeah. Are. But um, yeah, I I mean, yeah. When people ask me to play weddings and ask me to play my yeah. own songs, I'm like, I, I don't know if sure. I uh, don't know if there's anything you really want me to play. And yeah. um, as a side note, it's pretty hard to find a happy love song to um, to play acoustically at a wedding. I've yeah. found that pretty hard, but. I am um, Captain Sensible's Happy Talk. You could <laughs> start. <laughs> I'm not sure how many people would enjoy it. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but I, I mean, I'm not sure how many how many people would relate on a personal level to that song. Um, people seem to enjoy my sadder songs uh, when I play them live. But yeah, for me, it is is a process of sorting through my own feelings my own um perceptions of the world and i mean sometimes i'll get to the end of a song and i'll be like oh no you, you're totally wrong about the situation that you're looking at some of the songs that i wrote in my for my first album i'm like oh no you were you were in a weird misguided place. <laughs> yeah um and and you just need a bit of perspective but maybe the maybe the song puts it in perspective um I come out of a lot of uh, finishing a lot of songs and think, great, I've got this as a a real landmark of how I was feeling at a time. Mm. And I've spoken to other songwriters who are, you know, it's it's a bit of a struggle when you're playing stuff live as well to take yourself back to when you wrote something and get yourself in that emotional turmoil to be able to convey that properly. But it's definitely something that's important for me to get out. If I didn't have um, songwriting, I don't know how much I would actually uh, be able to sort through emotionally. Yeah. And on another note, within the music community, I've managed to find a lot of men who are quite happy to be open in their songwriting. And through that, our relationships have become quite deeper because once it's out there, it becomes okay to talk about. It's no longer something that you're holding within you. Mm. Um, yeah, I've got one close friend who who's written a lot of self-focused uh, songs and I guess it, it, it was a way of me to access a part of him that I don't think I'd seen before. Mm. And vice versa, I think a lot of people have probably seen a side of me that I don't openly put out there. Mm. Do you think, you know, looking back on time, um, you know, going back to the sort of the earlier you and, and ask this question because you know, a lot of our listeners are parents and, you know, parents are boys and mm. thinking about, you know, my son's headed down this uh, creative path and, you know, well, how's he going to go and what's he going to do? I mean, having... Um, you know, sort of reaching a more mature point in your career and you're looking back, you know, what, what, what are some advice you'd give in terms of the way of being for parents, you know, and that walking alongside? And particularly if you can think back, you know, to those sort of tumultuous years where you've also, you've got this, you know, 
as Aristotle describes the same thing with with the arts process. You know, it's a catharsis. It's about an exchange of you know engaging with material and and you know through that I guess manifesting you know the inner becomes that it's excarnated. It's become a something, um, and I guess it's turbocharged a bit when you when you're a teenage boy. Yeah. What would be your advice to parents? You know, how do they kind of work? Is it a, do they provide guidance or boundaries and you know no no do your scales you know no you need to know (laughs) the phrygian mode or whatever it is you know or no no just look just i get it you're hurting and you know here i am you know i'm yeah papa swan just you know i'm gonna look after you what do you think (laughs) (laughs) um forget the papa swan bit uh i think viewing any creative pursuit as a legitimate pursuit is really important I feel like uh, anyone can, any young person is able to regulate how they approach um, music or art or acting. And they know, I mean, they're able to gain access to how it is that they would get to a point that they can see in the future. But one thing that definitely didn't help me was... uh, as much as it came from a good place, um, the dialogue of what's your backup plan, don't, don't you think, mate, what about teaching? Stuff like that, which, you know, no... Now, Jim, did, hang on. No discredit <laughs> no, to teaching, hang on. nothing like that. But Pushing a few buttons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, that was always, that was always a, um, you know, a, a replayed phrase or, you know, phrases like that. Whereas, like, have you thought about doing this? Which all come from a good place, but it also delegitimizes yeah. what you're trying to achieve. And, you know, I've got, I've got two very supportive parents. They're both great people. Um, but it's, it's those tiny things that kind of wreck something for me. Um, or that's way over the top wreck something it definitely um made it harder for me to believe in myself and to um believe that what i was doing was important and yeah like both of my parents have come to shows and you know they've they've said they liked it and whatnot um it wasn't until my music started to sound like it was being uh, produced on a professional level that my dad started commenting on it mm-hmm. um, in a positive way. Um, and I just feel like there is something in that that it, it, that product isn't any different to what I was producing when I was younger. Um, it just sounds different because I figured out how to put money behind it. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, that, I, that idea that if it, if it doesn't sound great to one person, then it mustn't be great. Um, Because I know that what I do isn't my dad's cup of tea um, or it's not totally his cup of tea. Um, Similar to my mum, not all of it's her uh, brand of music that she likes or... um, But it certainly doesn't make it any um, less valid as something that should be put out into the world. Um, And I think that young people... Uh, hearing that it's that you know maybe people who are less enthusiastic about uh, something because it's not what their parents think is should be pursued mm. is yeah probably not a, it doesn't help them at all yeah yeah people know I mean we know don't we you know, I work a lot with young people and I always think you know they they know they have such a they do have a strong sense of self it's obviously being developed you know particularly in those adolescent years but um, you know there's, they know a lot more than I think adults sometimes give them credit for yeah. in terms of that I those reckon. big questions are the vocational stuff and yeah this is really what I want to do I'm pretty sure yeah actually um, there's two final questions we ask everybody and the first one is just about what is it to be a good man these days um I think for me, what I, what I believe in, in being a man is a good sense of uh, self and self-reflection, always reflecting on 
who you are uh, rather than accepting who you are. Um, you can always tell yourself that you're a certain way and that you're not a certain way. But if you reflect on the decisions that you make on a daily basis or a weekly basis, I think that that has the uh, capacity to really let you grow. I think, yeah, the idea of growth is a big one um, for me. And, yeah, never allowing yourself to set in stone that you are a certain way. And same with your beliefs. Um, always allowing yourself to change those. Um, yeah, in the last two decades, I've I've changed so much, and that's hopefully for the better. In my in my opinion, it's for the better. Um, and who knows? In twenty years, I might be completely different again, but hopefully for the better. Yeah, no doubt. Um, and the last question uh, for today, Jim, is uh, if you had a story you could tell a 14-year-old or thereabouts and he'd listen, what would the story be or advice? I think to not worry, uh, to not indulge worry or anxiety. Um, it, I think a lot of my decisions when I was younger were made to try to appease a part of me that was worried about the future mm. and now I'm in the future and it just didn't matter. So I guess, yeah, my, my personal story is that all of the worry and anxiety of the past never came to anything, no matter how much it felt like it would. Mm. Fell away and came undone. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice way to wrap it up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was hoping I could get a line from one yeah. of your songs <laughs> and not butcher it um, this time. Um, Jim, it's been such a great pleasure to talk to you today. Um, as I said, I'm personally a, a massive fan of, of what you do. I love um, I love how I feel when I listen to your music, so it's probably no higher uh, compliment I can give you than that one. So thank you for your time. Thank you for um, your openness and, you know, being vulnerable and prepared to, you know, to talk about some of the things that don't often and don't always get talked about um, in different ways. And, you know, we wish you the very best um, in the unfolding of your career and, and the next 20 years. Cheers, Ray. It's Thank been you. my pleasure. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Understanding Boys podcast. Make sure you subscribe on your podcast app and please leave us a review to help grow the community. For more information about the podcast, visit understandingboys.com.au. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>